Okay. Hi guys, I'm Luke Henry from LDB Accountants. Uh, now I'm going to make Amy stand up as well. Amy's also from LDB, so if you've got any questions along the way, uh, feel free to shoot them off, well, perhaps save them to the end. Um, but if you run out of time today in today's session, we'll go and cover them out at lunch. Um, so just feel free to come up and grab one of us and have a chat. We don't bite. Um, so when I was having a chat with Tony um, this year, talking about um, some of the ideas of what we wanted to, I suppose, explore in a business stream um, for, for GCAP, one of the uh, things that stood out most often for a lot of our clients is the fact that cash flow is this massive problem. So one of the things that I identified very quickly in the piece um, through working with probably about 40 odd studios is the fact that there's a lot of enthusiasm to get in there and get started on a particular project, but there's not necessarily a lot of uh, thought process put into, well, what does that actually look like from a business standpoint? So today we're going to um, cover off some, hopefully, well, hopefully I've explained it in a way that makes sense, but it's pretty crunchy at times. So you may not necessarily grab all of it, but um, the slides will be available. And as I said, we'll be around for, for questions. So I thought I'd start it off by um, putting some memes up. Now, look, it, I, it is a bit of a shit sandwich in that I've got to give you something interesting at least before we get into the tech stuff. Now, I, I was a bit worried when I f um, first um, did this yet. Well, actually, I was putting this one in yesterday, and I thought, oh, maybe there's a bit of a copyright issue there. So I, I reached out to one of my um, mates, uh, Damien Holder, and, and he put that together for me last night. So um, I'll give him a bit of a plug and, and say, it, not only is he a great artist, he's also a really good um, DM. So <laughs> they're coming in. All right. So. To understand the context, we want to actually explore, and it's a little bit of a dark topic, but why do businesses fail? And there's lots of information out there about this. The Australian Bureau of Statistics um, has pointed out through numerous studies that roughly half of businesses uh, fail in the first three years of operation. And it's an interesting one because why is that? What's actually triggering it? Well, ASIC does a number of studies, and there was one um, in 2013. There's also one more recently in 2017 that cited a number of factors. And in, in this case, 41% of business failures uh, were attributed to poor cash flow. That's second behind poor strategic management, but uh, that's a topic for another day. Um, one of the other interesting insights that were there was from Xero. And now Xero um, is interesting because not only do you pay for their software, but they get access to all of your data. And so they're able to draw out interesting insights like this. <laughs> Uh, where 50.1% of small business had positive cash flow as of June 2017. So we'll come to what positive cash flow means, but that's a, a pretty scary thing. Uh, and it means that we really need to put in place the right steps and, and really think through what it is we're trying to achieve when we're starting out in business to make sure that we're not going to run in and be one of these statistics. So what is cash flow? Now, this is, I suppose it's a, it's something that's just assumed that most people will know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway, and that way at least you'll get a little bit of background information. So really what we're talking about is uh, the different bet difference between the cash that's available at the beginning of a period and the amount that's available at the end of the period. And that's essentially recognising a, a net position between cash coming into the business from various sources, as well as cash going out. Positive cash flow is achieved where the money that's coming in is higher than the money that is going out. Or in this case, uh, you know, that closing balance is greater. Negative cash flow is the opposite, where you're spending more money than you've got coming in. Another common concept and something that becomes very important for you guys to understand is that for a lot of what we're talking about today, we're talking about cash and cash flow. Accounting numbers are recognised in an accrual system. So accruals are essentially recognising when you recognise income. Cash is more about when you actually receive that income. So cash accounting recognises the period in which you receive or make the payment for your sales and purchases. Accrual accounting recognises the period in which you make the sale and receive the bill. And that's your business profit. 
Now, in a lot of cases, they're going to be very similar, and certainly for a lot of startup studios, that will be the case. You won't have a lot of uh, sort of accrual recognition, but the easiest way to understand the difference is you might choose to push off the payment of a particular invoice that you've incurred to provide you with some cash flow. So, one of another meme that I put together. Now, I should say, uh, I had a really tough job um, when I was putting these slides together. While Amy was there extracting the numbers from zero and putting together all the charts, um, I was playing around with meme generator. So, I'm sorry, Amy. Um, it's important to note for a lot of guys that are working with Apple or, or certainly any of the um, ad providers, the revenue that's coming in, you, you may well get a sale of the game, but it won't be for a couple of months before you actually see any dollars come through. That's usually around 30 days from end of month. So why are we here today? Well, it's, it's to actually understand a little bit around cash flow modelling. So what is cash flow modelling? It's, it's the practice of planning and forecasting the sources and uses of cash. So it's about saying, well, where are we going to get this money from and how are we going to use it? Its ultimate objective is to provide a framework that enables effective and efficient use of available cash. So recognising that, that cash is, is finite. We, we've only got a certain amount of it, unless you have a, a wildly successful game the last time around, or you're sitting on an inheritance or something like that, um, and you don't have to worry about it. We really have to make sure that we understand you know, what it is that we've got available and how long that's going to run for us. It enables companies to manage solvency more proactively. So what I mean by that is that in the biggest risk to a lot of companies uh, being the failure to have positive cash flow and maintain positive cash flow will affect their solvency and the ability for them to operate under the Corporations Act. Particularly for you guys that are directors, it's something to be very aware of because insolvency, the opposite of solvency, is one of your director's duties. It improves sustainability of the organisation and promotes an understanding of the impact of drivers on cash flow, leading to better business decisions. So uh, I appreciate that certainly for a lot of people getting into the game, um, you know, it's enthusiasm and an idea that starts the process, but it's really about um, making sure that you're around for the next idea and having that longer term uh, approach to being successful in business. Business at times can be a bit of a dirty word, I suppose. Um, but it, that longevity is promoted by good business activities and ca cash flow modelling and cash flow management is one of those. So, so really what we're trying to do is create a framework there and, and that's really about the effective and the efficient use of that limited resource that we have. So you might be saying, well, I don't have time for that. But it's really important, as we said earlier, just to bring it back to those stats we started out with, that you must have that planning done at the start in order to have put yourself in the best position to succeed. So you must take the time and invest it in this process. So let's talk about, I suppose, when we're building a cash flow model, where do we start? And, and I think for a lot of studios, it's a bottom-up approach. So it's really about talking about costs first, because costs are what the business will start with, and often revenue is something that comes later on uh, after your initial design. The biggest cost to business is wages. That's a good thing, but it is a cost to business. And, and part of that is because even for yourself as, as perhaps the, the lead of a team, um, you know, you need something to pay the rent, um, and unless you like eating two-minute noodles, um, you probably need a little bit more money to get some sustenance. So wages become an important part. In addition, there's some mandatory costs that come with wages, and they're essentially reflected in the overhead burden that we would see. So that's superannuation, which is mandatory. Uh, work cover insurance, and occasionally it's an optional thing as non-cash benefits. So. We've done a bit of a, a sweep of the industry, really focused on um, small startup companies. And, and the figure that we've used for the purposes of today is a wage figure of $5,000 per person per month. Now that's not $5,000 take home, of course, there's POIG tax that's taken out of that. 
Uh, it's the good news is that's roughly in line with sort of um, medium wages, um, but you're certainly not a high income earner, which you would expect um, coming out of a, um, a small studio startup. It is probably worth saying that you know to have a family and all those sorts of things, you probably need a little bit more than that. And for the purposes of our, our estimates, um, we'll use an on-cost percentage of 10%, which is really mostly superannuation, but also allows for a little bit of work cover. The next cost of business is occupancy. So really this is about saying, well, I've got a team, I'm bringing them together, where are they going to sit? Where, you know, what is it that they're actually going to be working on? They need the resources and the tools to be able to actually come together as a team and produce um, the game that they're working on. So really we're talking here about rent, um, utilities, internet access, and any particular hardware that's required. Uh, for the purposes of today, um, I've used a small studio in the arcade with a, an overhead cost of around $1,600 per month. Um, you can, of course, look at other uh, alternative places to locate a team. There's plenty of serviced offices. I know certainly the, the larger teams would, um, you know, bigger development studios would be actually renting their own space. Um, for certainly in the, in, the, in the initial stages, you're looking for something that's got flexibility. And then there are other costs. Um, so other costs are essentially a catch-all for everything else. Um, we're talking about software licensing, uh, subscriptions. There's going to be, I suppose, certain business costs that you'll incur. Um, there's professional fees involved, with, which uh, is both uh, LDB as accountants, but also um, lawyers, um, Cam Rogers. I, I think most, a lot of people would have come across him over time. He does a lot of work for the games industry. Um, it's important to get involved with and get support on the professional side because it can be a, I suppose, a bit of a, well, there's a lot of pitfalls. There's lots of things you can get wrong and it's sometimes it's easy just to pick up the phone and ask a, a simple question to get a resolution on things. For the purposes of today, we've run with a, an estimate for a small studio of around about $2,000 a month. Um, and again, we've based that on a, a a quick grab uh, across our client base of like size studios. So in terms of the cost of project, well, these are unique costs. Now, these are the variable items that don't, well, tend to vary depending on the particular project that, that's been considered. So if you're looking at any successful um, project or any su successful game, you'll have a number of these costs. Marketing is obviously um, a key element and, and I wouldn't know too many games that are unsuccessful without a marketing allocation. It does depend very much on the, the type of game that you're producing and there certainly are, I suppose, probably more in the mobile space. It tends to be a little bit more fluid uh, in terms of how you'll spend your marketing dollars. Other costs of project could include royalties to external IP owners. So if you're making the next Games Workshop game, then obviously they're going to have probably a, quite a good chunk of your flesh um, in terms of your sales. Contractors, just like with professional services, um, you can't do everything, so you need certain particular experts and it's important to engage the right people there, so there'll be an extra cost. They'll come and go as required and they'll come in ideally for particular specialist skill set requirements. And other costs of project, um, I've put there server hosting, uh, I know certain clients, not applicable for everyone, but there are certain clients that have fairly um, robust hosting requirements and uh, as a part of that, that's actually a fairly significant cost. Now we're not really going to consider these in too much detail today, um, mostly because they tend to be more ad hoc, but I would encourage you when you're actually setting out on your, your costing journey that you consider all of these elements and consider whether it's appropriate for your particular release to have expenditure allocated to these particular line items. As I said, marketing is probably a big one, but marketing is one of those things, how far do you go? So I've put together a, a chart and I hope that's sort of legible. Um, there's a lot of information on it, but essentially what we've done is we've taken those costs that are listed earlier and we've put them up there on the basis of uh, a four-man studio. So this is the expected cost structure on a month-by-month -month basis 
of a four-man studio over a period of 12 months. Sitting a little over $25,000 a month. So what we can conclude from, I'll jump back to it, what we can conclu conclude from this is that there's a burn rate, there's a consistent outflow of cash that is occurring month on month. And that burn rate is really important for you guys to understand and, and know exactly how long you've got. Because it's going to set your time in production and your time in business, I should say, in that if you don't get revenue through the door, then eventually you are going to run out of money and you'll be one of those statistics. So it impacts your production in the context of saying, well, we can't continue to sustain these costs here for 24 months based on the resources that are available to us and the cash that we've started out with. And you should be setting your production in line with that. Now, the last point is really about development cycle and, and I use the term cadence and I think it's really important. A lot of the successful studios that I've seen have been able to rely on the fact that this particular cost structure is occurring month on month and the way in which they manage that is they're continually releasing and jumping onto the next project. And so for successful studios, it's not just about the project that's there in front of you today, but the project that's coming along next. Because without that ongoing recurrence of income and, and I suppose the cadence of entering a project, starting that up, getting it to a release and then getting sales through the door, you won't necessarily be able to meet up with your and stay on top of the burn rate. So now we'll flip it around and we've covered off costs in a bit of detail. Let's talk about cash inflow. Now, inflows really come from a variety of different sources and, and my view is that they they've, that can be broken down into essentially four stages, which this chart uh, explores. There's early stage, which is essentially the concept. This is very much embryonic. It's right at the start of the piece. And, and for a lot of startup studios, maybe they haven't even formalised their business plans yet. Mid stage is you're very much in development cycle. Production is occurring. You're very much in your, your burn rate, so to speak. And, and your outgoings are really occurring at that stage. Late stage costs, they're essentially at, or po sorry, late stage income is essentially at or post launch and they're from non-sales sources. So we use this to describe, well, we'll see in a minute, but a number of um, lagging cash flow inflows that will provide the business with some ongoing revenue, but unfortunately generally come in a little bit too late in the piece. And then the last is obviously the revenue pipeline and that's post-launch, as, as uh, Yoda told us earlier, you know, you'll have to wait a little bit until Apple comes around and, and pays that money out or any of the other providers. So one of the interesting items that we explored and, and we saw very quickly in, in our analysis was the fact that early stage funding isn't always necessarily cash inflow. For a lot of studios, it's sweat equity. And what we mean by sweat equity is people working for below what would in theory be a market uh, wage. So they're operating below market rates on the basis that they can get their idea off the ground. And the vast majority, is, uh, majority of studios that I've worked with, certainly when they're in the startup stage, will engage in this practice. And there's probably a few people in the room that are in this right now that are seeing it and saying, yeah, I can hopefully empathise with that. So really what we're talking here is in this early stage that we're reducing costs as opposed to getting money in through the door. And you may be able to do that and keep your costs below, say, $10,000 a month for the first six months by taking a pay cut of four grand a person. Again, it's not sustainable, but for a lot of um, particularly grants, that's something they're going to come to see uh, and expect you to be contributing. Other early stage funding. Well, it's going to come from a number of different sources. Personal funds are obviously a big reserve and certainly for those that are relying on sweat equity, personal funds are probably what allow you to pay the rent and continue to put food on the table. 
You may also engage in contract work, um, which is really relying on your particular expertise to subsidise your costs. It will slow your development down, but at the same time, it will provide you with some cash flow and, and some initial um, drive. And perhaps it buys you time to get into some of the next stages. And thirdly, fundraising. Um, now, I break that down into related party and third party sources. For a lot of startup studios, it's quite common to have support from their family and friends. Um, you'll see, certainly yesterday, there was a number of good talks there from um, V and Jen on the types of third party financing that's available, uh, whether that's VC, particular investors. Uh, I won't dwell on that too much. I think that those guys have, have done a really good job of presenting on that information already, and I'd encourage you to yeah, reach out and um, have a look at those slides. So early stage funding is really coming in on this chart in that sort of three month window. Now the blue line is your release. That's when you're launching. So you can see there that the revenue is coming in well in advance of an actual release. And it's only going to cover your costs in those initial stages, unless you have a, a lot of money coming through, but it's, um, you know, that's going to be very reliant on the sources of finance that you can achieve. So mid-stage funding. Mid-stage funding, we've broken down to a couple of different sources. There's funds coming in from uh, crowdfunding, so your Kickstarters, your Indiegogos, I think they're an interesting model. Um, the results that I've seen are a bit mixed. Uh, it's great for building a community, I think, in a lot of instances, but doesn't necessarily provide a huge amount of ongoing cash flow to the business. Filmvic production grants have been um, great, and, and I'd say a lot of the startup studios have been able to get in and get on board with these, and they've been able to facilitate the covering of costs, as I mentioned earlier. For a lot of studios, it's combined with the contribution of sweat equity. And producer funding, um, Chris Wright from Surprise Attack is obviously, you'll see him around. Um, there's a number of other people out there that are providing it. Um, you can, of course, also work with some of the big wigs over in the US. Um, if you're able to secure, I suppose, a, a contact at GDC um, and work with the likes of Warner Brothers and all those sorts of um, companies. But generally for a startup, that's going to be a bit of a challenge uh, unless you've got the right contacts. So mid-stage funding, what we've seen is it tended to be in spikes and it, and it comes after that three month period. So you've very much got your concept down pat. You know what it is you're doing, you know what your development cycle is looking like. You've got some polish. You may even have a little bit of tech demo or something like that. You're actually able to go out and reach out to these other sources and they'll provide you, I suppose, a degree of funding initially to get you moving and get you up to that release point. Now, late stage funding is one of these interesting areas, and this is often where we get involved because it's relying on structured grants and the like. Uh, I wanted to talk quite just quickly on EMDG. Um, it's, it's a grant that I haven't seen a lot of studios use, but where I have seen it used, it's been incredibly effective at supporting their marketing efforts in particular. What it is essentially there for is it's an Austrade initiative. It's designed to promote Australian businesses overseas and they'll actually reimburse 50% of costs incurred annually. Uh, now that means that you can actually get across to see these particular producers. It means you can get across to GDC and put your game out there. It means you can produce promotional uh, materials. And, and I have seen it used for actually for user acquisition. Um, so it's a great way to defray the cost. Unfortunately, you do have to incur the cost, but then once you've incurred it, this will provide you with a, a reimbursement after the fact. Now it's handled annually via Austrade. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet. I encourage you to have a look at it. If you've got any questions, ask Amy because she's the MDG expert. Um, on top of that, there are a lot of marketing grants. So we talk here, um, we've seen a lot of grants around from Creative Victoria. Pax Rising has been an interesting system in terms of getting, uh, I suppose, the indie studios out there on the floor. They're not uh, going to be massive, 
uh, cash inflows, but they'll help defray some of that marketing cost that, that sits there and will provide you with an opportunity to get out there and do a little bit more. Film Vic again is, is pivotal here in terms of providing marketing structured grants. So whilst there's production grants available, that the grants that I have seen have tended to be more focused on, on the marketing side. And I'd encourage everyone to um, have a look at that and explore. I appreciate it's a very competitive process. Um, but it will assist in um, covering those costs, which can be substantial around the release point. The next area and the last, I suppose, key area of late stage funding, and, and I've dedicated two slides to this because it's one that's dear to my heart, uh, is the R&D uh, tax incentive. Um, it goes on a tax return. It's essentially processed as a refund of costs that are incurred on eligible core activities. So what I mean by that is you need to engage in R&D activities that are a process of moving from a hypothesis through a period of analysis, through scientific testing to get to a result. Now, my view is that for a lot of studios out there, um, that is certainly the case, particularly with the implementation of new technology. And it's a great opportunity to explore whether you can cover some of your costs um, in development as part of that process. It's not for everyone, I, I would say. Um, it really requires you to be producing new knowledge. So the challenge there is it's not just content, it's not a title as such, but it is actual new tech knowledge. And as I said, it's a refund of 43.5% of costs incurred, which can be substantial, particularly if you're talking about that burn rate we had earlier. It's a two-stage process. Uh, first stage is to register uh, your activities with Oz Industry, and they'll assess the eligibility, and then you'll actually come and claim it on your tax return. Uh, now that does mean that from a timing perspective, we're actually making the claim when we do our tax return, which is an annual piece that ends at 30 June. So depending on where you are in the development cycle, you'll have to incur the cost before 30 June, and then make the claim and claim on the tax return after 30 June. And that could be up to 10 months later in the year. So there's, a, there's a, quite a, a timing difference there. So late stage funding, you're really talking about cash inflows that are coming after release. And that's important to understand that in a lot of cases, this late stage funding to a degree is essentially the funding you'll use for the next project as opposed to the current project. So the last source is this revenue pipeline. And I, I wish I had for you today a crystal ball as to what would make a successful commercial release. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you there's, one of the interesting things is that I've seen a lot of really dedicated great teams work on um, great products and they've fallen flat. And I've seen a lot of teams that I perhaps thought weren't taking it particularly seriously um, and were able to work on the basis of sweat equity and get things off the ground, and they hit the zeitgeist and they you know, push a million units and suddenly they're sitting on a whole lot of cash. So unfortunately, there is no real um, clear measure of predicting success in sales. But what we can do is we can identify a couple of trends that, that are consistent. Um, early income is a strong indicator, and what what I mean by that is that generally that first month of sales is going to be your best month. After that, income tends to track on a bell curve. So it'll tend to curve slightly at the top and then fall off a cliff. Uh, and depending on where that is, um, really, I think the best games are the ones that have fat tails. They actually don't have that cliff face. They tend to stick around and they dwindle down slowly. So that actually provides a really strong, consistent cash flow over that next term. One of the interesting things we noted was that staggered launches actually creates waves in revenue, which is not surprising. Um, in that releasing on, say, Apple and then releasing on um, Google will, will essentially cause multiple spikes in your revenue line. 
And as I pointed out earlier, just because you're getting the sales at release, you'll still be waiting between 30 and 60 days after the release point to actually collect any dollars. So hopefully after that, I've jammed as much information into your brain as possible. And this is you. Or that might be you. <laughs> so the thing about this is you guys aren't coming from a business background, right? So it is quite a technical area. Ask questions. It's really important. And, and you can come and ask myself um, or you can go and ask other people that are in business that ask them about the actual financial side, not just about the creative side, but how did they do it? How did they fund it? So let's have a bit of a chat around um, some examples. So these are um, some models that we've, we've seen come through. Um, I've blended a couple of different client results, and so this is not necessarily tracking to any one particular uh, studio or client of mine, but we've been able to create some revenue lines that give you an indication of how cash inflows occur. So this, um, this particular data set was based on a combination of crowdfunding, grant and then sales income. And we found that um, in this instance, a lot of the cash inflow occurred prior to release and the sales result perhaps didn't quite come through. Now those particular projects are, are going to have their own, I suppose, particular issues, but it created in this instance a lot of initial cash inflow and driver, but then didn't give enough um, cash inflow afterwards to roll into the next project. Um, this particular um, example was a series of grants. So this actually had quite a long development cycle where you can see um, it's roughly 20 months. And, and I should add all of these um, particular examples that I've put out today, um, really they're based on a, a financial data and obviously we don't have the information to understand how long an idea has been in an embryonic statement stage and someone's been smashing away at it for 36 months in their mum's garage. So we don't really know that. Uh, this one was interesting in that you can see here the, the staggered peaks of um, multiple launches across different platforms, creating a new trend or a new spike in revenue. The bell curve is really evident there in terms of that revenue in that early stage spiking through. And then you can see it trickling down. Cash flow in the early start stages, so that first 20 month period, has really been driven by uh, grants which are from a combination of sources. So in this instance, this, this particular um, studio group was, was successful in that um, that's actually provided a significant amount of their initial capital. Um, dare I say it, there was still that sweat equity contribution coming in. But the spikes in revenue that occurred afterwards are what have allowed them to roll into the next project. Now this one was interesting, um, there's not too many clients that, f that I was able to sort of fit into this data set. Um, it was a, a fairly substantial lead time and it didn't have a lot of, I suppose what you'd call that mid-stage cash inflow. So they were very much reliant on the sweat equity model to get up and running. Uh, initial income was a combination of grants as well as a component of contracting. but. Really, they only came to the contracting much later in the piece, almost after the release. So it didn't give them any support in those early stages. The spike you're seeing um, just after a release is actually interesting and it's a combination of the release itself as well as the timing of the R&D refund, creating a really big spike there. Again, the bell curve is to a degree evident that we can see that it peters down and, and there's a, a tail there. Now, this, this particular example um, is an interesting one in that this is only based on one model. This is actually a failed uh, business. And 
you're seeing these jagged teeth here. Now, what that actually represents is the fact that the, the release was a mess. And so the sales defied that bell curve that we saw earlier in that it was essentially cycling through a patch process. Uh, so initial income was a combination of um, grants as well as a little bit of producer funding has uh, helped out with that. Um, the timing of it enabled a little bit of an R&D inflow as well that supported cash flow in the early stages. And then upon release, um, the actual financial results were, yeah, quite bizarre. They, they spiked all over the place, very, very hard to track. Uh, and ultimately this studio found that it wasn't able to provide any, I suppose, sustainable income in that afterwards period. And so uh, this is an example of a, a failed failure. Um, this last example is modelled on two case studies that were highly successful. And the interesting thing about them was the fact that in this instance, they didn't use a lot of external funding and they didn't actually use a lot of what I would call traditional methods to derive cash flow in those early stages. They actually went in with a, a very controlled process around what their costing was up front. So they eliminated all of their wage and essentially relied on external jobs. And they were able to, on the back of that, essentially progress the, the, the game through to release without incurring a significant amount of costs. What happened then is that the release was successful and in both instances we saw actually a delayed onset of revenue. It, it, it rose initially quite successfully and then as it hit the, the zeitgeist, it, it continued to rise. And, and so you actually saw a dip and then it, and then it, it relaunched. As it's petered out along, it's, it's actually had a, this fat tail that I described earlier where you can see here um, down the bottom, your income is actually not all quarantined in this particular window, but it's spread. There's actually a fairly sizable component of revenue recognised here in this six to 12 month period. So that's, in that instance, has been able to provide them with a very healthy ongoing um, cash flow that's, that's really covered them into the next probably three projects. So I'm just going to cycle back to um, where we started off, which is it's not an easy process to go through this. Um, it's not something that you're just going to scratch down on the back of an envelope. Uh, it's something that I think warrants a lot of care and attention. But once you invest the time in it and, and you and it might be a couple of days, you can actually forecast this out. And I'd work through on the basis of a bottom-up uh, approach where you, you start with your costings, figure out what your development cycle is likely to look like, start working out, well, how much you're going to spend on marketing, what's the time frame like there, and then start looking at and exploring ways in which you can get cash inflow into your business to support what it is that you want to do. Um, so look, I've put our contact details up here. Um, my name's up there as well, but I think Amy's probably the person to speak to in a lot of cases. Um, and I've also put Cam Rogers' um, details up there. Uh, Cam is a, a lawyer who works in the industry. I'd encourage everyone to, particularly if you're starting out, to have a chat with him. Um, he's very approachable. Um, his details are there. Unfortunately, he, he couldn't be here today. He's actually over in Adelaide, but he works remotely. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage you to reach out and speak to us. We don't bite. So that gives us a bit of time. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so. Uh, you kind of mentioned the late stage uh, inflow, and you were going through a few of the lists, and you mentioned uh, one of them was uh, the marketing related stuff. I think it was Phil and Vic. Yes. So they kind of just, you have to pitch to them what you want to do for the marketing and then they just say, hey, um, we'll give you a grant for that or do they actually support it with some marketing? The, look, uh, my experience to date has been that they've been um, quite helpful in advising the best way to 
facilitate it, but I would say you'd want to speak with them about it. Yeah. On that note, can I just point out that yeah. Liam Rabbit's film, Biggest Scene, right? There he is. Liam, but he's, he's the guru if you want to speak about it. So ask Liam. Can I ask him a question? Yeah. <laughs> just ask him for money. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, are the quantities on Australian dollars or US dollars? Uh, this is all Australian dollars, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because US dollars, was, I think it's like most, most publishers or investors will just say, yeah, I'll give you yeah. $1,000 for a start. So that's, yeah. that's quite high. Look, I, I think it's an interesting one because depending on what you're developing for, if, you, you know, if you're talking about a, a PC title, um, it might be, I think... Um, Might have been. Uh, no, I didn't. I don't. I think it's blended in with the data set. Yeah, it's a little bit in here actually. Um, but the data set that that's there for PC games uh, releases, the development site was massive in, this, in that instance. Um, and and it, I think it meant in that case that that was necessary to um, reach out and get that that. VC funding actually say, look, this is the full breadth of what it is that we're going to incur. Um, and that's, I suppose, one, a good reason why you want to engage in this process is because anyone that's going to be looking for uh, funding, and dare I say it from Film Vic, mm -hmm. the expectation is that this is all very clearly documented. Yep. And if you use that one to try and get you through the other nine that don't do as well, three will kind of break even and the rest will be a write-off. Yes. Uh, given all of the numbers that you're looking at, in terms of, uh, clearly everyone wants to make money all the time, but yes. how many hits versus misses do you think are reasonable based on the sorts of things that you're looking uh, at? It's a really good question. Um, and, and I think it depends certainly on the platform for starters right. in, the, in, the, in the mobile market. Um, well, I'll, I'll give... Um, um, Matt Titton and Ben uh, Smith a, a plug in that I saw their talk last year on the 12 week development cycle did you catch that one? Yeah. Which I thought was fantastic and, and a lot of what they were talking about in that talk is the, the fact that there's really a need to focus in on and constrain the development piece and I think in their case it ran and ran and ran and, and it didn't quite work out for them in that context but look I, I would say failure is a, is a likely prospect for a lot of things, and particularly in the mobile space. I've seen a number of studios that have kicked on for probably four years, um, and they've been able to generate sufficient cash flow just to keep them going into the next project. Um, the concern I would have is that you, you really want to get a successful project a way to create the, the cash flow that we saw here, yeah. and that's your one, in, your one in ten, so to speak. But it's very difficult to predict the title success. And as I said earlier, I'd love to be able to sort of say, yeah, this is the... Perhaps as a follow-on, is this scalable? If you scale this down to a six-month project or a three-month project, yep. do these perhaps change substantially? Or? Look, not dramatically. One thing I would say is that it struck me that... Well, there, there, were, there were almost two streams, and, and this is the fascinating thing. There was one, one particular studio that had a very, very long development cycle, one that I would argue is not sustainable. Sorry, I keep walking away from the lectern. Um, not sustainable. And, I, and I look, when I look at that, the burn rate meant that I, I was staggered that they were able to stay in business. But they were lucky in a way that they were able to secure some, um, some grant funding along the way, and that's what kept it through. Um, the, the next release that they did... They had a successful release. The next release they did was also successful and, and dare I say it, more successful. Um, and they were able to build on and, and they reached that sort of sustainable approach that the first release provided them cash flow coming through into the next project. I think the key here is, is that if you're not certain about the product and a lot of people aren't, particularly in the mobile space, um, that development cycle has to be really tight because with the burn rate that's there, you, you won't be able to make necessarily 10 titles to reach the nirvana, you'll, yeah, the, the first eight will put you out of business. Yeah. So there was only one uh, graph yep. is one in Chronos action that didn't have grants. Yes. Do you see it being sustainable if you're not in Victoria? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it's a... hasn't relied on it to a degree and and look one thing I would say is um, I feel think not because he's just in the room as well but I actually think Phil and Vic do a really great job of supporting the industry and what I would say is that a lot of the studios that I've seen have success have been able to get that cadence going it's those initial costs that burn you out so that been able to come in with a combination of sweat equity and some funding to get the release off the ground and get some revenue through the door will then create the next release. So if there isn't any funding in a state, you don't see it being? No, I think, I think there are still opportunities, but funding in that early stage then comes from different sources. Yeah. And it means then, um, I think, and we'll, and we'll start to see it. I, I think uh, V talked really well about um, that sort of seeking of capital, and I think I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so, it's a moving market. This space is constantly evolving. Um, and what you will see is, I think, growing comfort in third-party investment in, in games over time. Um, I think Chris Wright's recent um, announcement around what Surprise Attack are doing to try and create a, a little bit more venture capital in the space uh, is interesting. I, I don't know a lot about it, but we might sort of see, ideally, and I imagine this is what Film Vic is hoping for, is some of these third-party sources coming online to work with them and, and supplement those initial stages. Yeah. Would you say for the initial kickoff as your first work as a studio that this, this graph here would be your best kind of go, working part-time is the safest option, and then using that to then kick off the next game, the next game? I think it's, in, I think it's invariably a, something that everyone will have to consider that you, know, you need a, some form of inflow. If you don't have any cash coming in, then you very quickly won't have anything there just to sustain yourself, but also to cover costs that are really important in growing the business to the next step. You know, having money around for marketing, for example. Um, so yeah, this is this is both a, a good example and a terrible one in that it's very it's almost impossible to say that this can be achieved uh, consistently for other studios. Um, what I would say is you you should make sure that. Um, you consider that early stage funding and if it means that you know keeping yourself working in another industry for a period of time to build a little bit of a cash reserve I think that would be quite common for most people in the startup stage. Look, I, th I think the key with this and, and the effective modelling we've, we've spoken about today is really very focused on project. Um, but really what you want to be talking about is, well, what's the cash reserve that you need there in the kitty to provide for the burn rate that's going to occur over the next release cycle? And that's going to depend on each different team. Um, it might be that you need to retain and reinvest 100% of the profits so that you've got the funds there to roll into the next deal. Um, some of the best successes in this have reinvested those, those earnings into not just one but two projects. It's a little bit along the idea that you were talking earlier that you, you, you throw a few out there and then you can improve your chance of success on a bigger release. But the other advantage to that having multiple projects on the go is that it creates a better rhythm in that you've seen here how lumpy this cash flow is. But if you've got, say, three or four projects that are working side by side, Hopefully you can stagger them so that you're not actually uh, having any massive inflows in particular periods and then really cash negative. Can I just add to that, Kev? Um, yep. Have you seen much in regards to like, people doing DLCs and stuff like that as well, like during like, post-product post release like, products? Yep. Look, I think DLC is an interesting one. What, what you probably see is uh, a similar result here. Now, I think that second spike is, as I said, is a, is a separate platform. DLC probably not going to get you the same result, but it might reset your sales trend and bring it back into, I suppose, the mainstream. Uh, you're seeing it with a lot of AAA titles, so they're really looking for that fat tail that we're talking about here. Yeah. I think 
we're done for time, I'm sorry. So, but I will be around, Amy will be around, so feel free to bail us up at lunch and, yeah, ask the questions. Hopefully the memes weren't too bad. <laughs>